Alwyn Zecker, welcome. I remember extremely well our conversation in Bali in Indonesia, your home country, in the aftermath of the devastating Bali bombings, when you told me that it was terribly important to realise how integrated the world economy was. Do you still feel that? I think more so than ever, particularly, especially in light of the, the most recent happenings, whether it be in the Eurozone or anywhere else. You know, it reminded me recently, I had the privilege, one of my classmates is a retired, one of the seven governors of the Federal Reserve System, the overall one in the United States. And I had a conversation with him a while back at our class reunion at the Harvard Business School. And I said to him, I said, Mike, his nickname is Mike. And I said, Mike, I said, you know, I'm a layman in this field of global, you know, high finance and everything else. I said, but tell me, people keep on saying, well, the U.S. dollar is going to be continuing to weaken. And I said, vis-a-vis -vis whom, because if so, who then is or which is going to be the stronger currencies? Now, I'm looking at a simplification in life is my motto, and that is if you have the U.S. dollar, you have the pound sterling, you have the euro at that time, and let's say at that time, and it's perhaps uh, the Japanese yen. Now, I said, now, which one is going to emerge to replace it because they are so totally intertwined that if one is down, who is going to definitely be the strongest of them all? I said, it's going to be relative, isn't it? I said, yes, it's going to be volatile. Yes, that it's going to change from day to day or week to week. I said, but I don't have the ability to forecast or to see which of, let's say, just those four. And he said to me, he says, Al, he says, you know, you're absolutely right. What do you make of tourism ministers calling on world leaders to invest in travel and tourism to kickstart the global economy? You see, obviously, it's like a motherhood statement. Nobody can quarrel with it nor say that it's absurd. The unfortunate part is that, you know, tourists, in other words, the product, if you wish, of tourism, people who come, don't vote for politicians. So, and therefore, they're like a milking cow for well, people who every so often come up with so-called bright ideas of taxing this part, taxing that part, and thereby slowly squeezing the cow that, you know, provides milk. Now, the problem there is that, of course, politicians have to say, that's marvelous, because we all know it's a smokeless industry, it creates employment, which is extremely urgently needed today, but it also means training. It means investment in the infrastructure. Then, all of a sudden, for the home front, they say, I have it for security reasons. So there are going to be impediments that the politicians, and therefore government leaders, will have to play to the home audience because of that. And that is where the dichotomy exists. You're widely listened to in the travel and tourism industry, a former president of PARTA, the influential Pacific Asia Travel Association. What advice would you give to tourism ministers and leaders of those countries whose tourism industries have been adversely affected by events such as terrorism, civil unrest, natural disasters? I relate tourism at any stage of its development, some are more mature than others. The analogy I would like to think of or draw is like literally taking, say, a lion or tiger cup away 
on, at birth, right? Never feeding them any raw meat, okay? They're fine, they get along, they're almost like pets. But once you feed them a piece of raw red meat, their natural instinct will surface. And that to me is an analogous to tourism. Once people have tasted, seen it, smelled it, heard it, touched it, you know, there's no holding back. So when it gets affected, it is literally probably the single most resilient industry because of the fact that you're not going to put the genie back in the bottle. And there it is. It is sad because, you know, take terrorism, for instance. You name me any destination on the globe that says I am 100% safe and will remain so. So we're in this. But, you know, the rest of life continues. And, yes, you must make the best of it. And don't ever think that anything is going to suppress tourism. It is absolutely impossible. All in marketing, Zeka, you're known as. Your newest venture is Ideal Hotels, representation for three and four star hotels around the world. Why have you decided to pursue this particular aspect of travel and tourism after 40 years in the business? Well, let's put it this way. I have had the great fortune, privilege, whatever you call it, to have had a hand in one form or another every single segment of the travel and tourism industry, whether it be you know, transportation, both aviation, uh, cruises, car rentals, you know, coaches, you name it, one form or another, as well as, of course, the hospitality industry, and, of course, the intermediary services, from wholesaling to retailing to you name it. It just fascinates me that this was something that hit me as an obvious vacuum that existed 15 years ago. The actual concept of ideal hotels came to mind 15 years ago. But when I started to seriously trying to position the concept, which is not entirely new because it's been done, but in a different sort of form where I saw a vacuum, it was not doable to also marry it with the eye-popping value for money. Is it just going to be another one, you know, one of the many? So it took a while, and the reason for it was very simple. I came to the conclusion that at that time, Remember, 15, 16 years ago, technology had not advanced. And one of the key reasons that I sort of went back to it 18 months ago was now we all know of the advances that technology The key was the communications that it enabled at, in, in general, Take the email at no cost. Now, so there is the spectrum of you know having information, distribution at no cost. Only then, so in s very simple terms, not not to come across as condescending, but when you have an opportunity of marrying or coupling. Marketing, which has always been my, you know, love, in fact, within any part of the internet, with technology, all of a sudden, I said to myself, 
Now is the time that we're able to do it. So it has nothing to do. I'm the type of person that gets challenged, you know, at different stages of my lifetime and say, oh, so when are you going to retire? And my usual answer is, I said, and do what instead? Do you think that three and four star hotels can really take advantage of the boom that we're seeing in the luxury tourism sector? You know, to say that it is obviously so is <coughs> simplistic. But let's look at any destination, I challenge you anywhere. Look at the number of establishments. It doesn't matter what classification, how large, how small, or what they call themselves. They will always be, and there is, has been, and will always be, in my opinion, more establishments in that middle bracket because of the fact that the nature of travel and tourism particularly, and especially the Asian mentality, which is now, of course, you know, everybody, the flavor of the decade is the, the booming outbound market from Asia. Take China, take India, etc. Brazil. Et that is where, particularly the Asian culture, says that it's nice to have all the trimmings and the amenities and so forth, but when we go to a destination, Let's first say, for leisure. No, we hardly spend time on the premises. Yes, it has to be safe and clean. Beyond that, comfort, yes. They'll put up even with a slightly less comforting feeling. So by definition, there will always be more of them, and they will continue to be a faster growing segment of the industry. I'm not saying that, you know, the top end will not grow, heaven forbid. But, of course, I also have a bit of a relationship to the very top end, the Amman resorts. You know, so, you know, but when you see this vacuum, this opportunity, this opening, I said, why not also? Because the very smaller ones, those that are farther away, from the hustle bustle of the cosmopolitan centers are the ones who would not otherwise be able to even have a presence beyond their own community, maybe beyond their own vicinity, maybe beyond their own national boundaries. How, how do they ever establish the fact that they exist? This is where Ideal Hotels came about. We feel based on the low-cost carriers, you know, the LCCs, the airlines, people now especially understand that you are free to pay, but if you need transportation, and I translate that into if you need accommodation, then just pay for what you want and what you need. The rest is optional.